apologize for a little bit of a delay. Two detours on the way here that I did not expect. So, a little difficult when you're coming from the opposite direction you're used to. Not prepared for that. So, uh, a call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 111. Turn with me in the Bible to Psalm 111. Ten verses. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart, in the company of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is his work. And his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has given food to those who fear him. He will remember his covenant forever. He has made known to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are truth and justice. All his precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Please join me as we go before the throne of grace and seek our God's favor this morning. <coughs> Dear Father, we do thank you again for this morning. We thank you for uh, this place that you've given us to gather as your people. And Father, this privilege that we now have to sing praises to the one who created all things. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for your spirit. We pray, Lord, for a special, a special uh, feeling of your spirit today. May we, may we know his presence. May we feel that he is here with us, that he is tutoring us as we listen, as we sing, and as we pray, Father, please, uh, we ask for your presence. We cannot do anything on our own, and Lord, we are unable to understand even the simplest of, of uh, doctrines without the aiding of your Spirit. So please, be with us this morning. Be with your servant, Al, as he brings the word to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn in your blue hymnals to hymn number 94. All of our hymns this morning will be out of the blue hymn. Hymn number 94. Hymn number 94. Hymn number 94. Hymn number 94. Genesis 18 and 25. Shall not the judge of all the earth be right?
hand. Keep your hymnals in hand and turn it heads to him 421. Rock of Ages. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. And that rock was Christ. For 
I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated for, from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. Through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For, through the two, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hate. What then shall we say? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. We pray that God would add his blessing to the reading and the preaching of his word this morning. We go to prayer once again. We'll be remembering, as I just mentioned, the compound in the Far East. The constant danger that they are surrounded by, danger of life and limb. As we already said, no comfort, very little safety. And their time is entirely devoted to the work at hand. So we'll be remembering them, and we'll also be remembering uh, our brother Rob as he recovers from surgery, and uh, as well Diane and Daniel. So let's go before the Lord. Again, Father, when we reflect on the words we've just read from your the Holy Scripture, we're dumbfounded. But knowing what we know, knowing what the Apostle Paul knew that he would still have such a burden for the lost that he would wish himself to be accursed. Father, again we say that may this attitude be found in us, that we have an absolute burden for the lost. I think of family members and friends who don't know the Lord Jesus and are perishing in their sin. Father, please help us as your people to have compassion on the lost, as Christ our Savior did. We do think of the compound in the Far East, Father, where many are gathered, over 600 people now are gathered, and the ones who are there taking care of the orphans, taking care of all of their needs, both physical and spiritual, Father, we pray that you would be with them, that you would continue to protect them, that your hand would be upon them, and that you might bless the work that they are doing, knowing that it is for your kingdom. Please, Father, allow that work to expand, and we pray that there would be no no imminent danger to them. We would remember also our brother Rob as he recovers from surgery. Father, please strengthen him. Please allow him to heal quickly and completely. Allow him to be as free from pain as possible. We thank you, Father, for these doctors that you've given both for him and for Diane who are capable and able to do these types of operations. But Father, we know they are only able to do so because you have given them the ability. So Father, please, Allow our brother and our sister to heal, to heal quickly, and may you bless them and their families. And again, Lord, we would ask that you would be in our midst here now as uh, Al will soon be coming to uh, preach your word. Mm -hmm. Father, it's certainly a very solemn task. Lord, we do not handle your word with carelessness. We do so with reverence and fear and trembling. Mm -hmm. Please be with our brother. We pray that your spirit would be upon him, that you would give him strength, clarity of thought, and that we might hear in a way that pleases you. Father, please bless
bless your people now and forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Again, from the Blue Hymnal, it's Hymn 574. 574, we'll remain seated and sing from Romans 9, verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Mm -hmm.
Good morning. So far, so good. I've turned my sound system on. So good. <laughs> this morning, I want to uh, to spend some time looking at a passage that is found in the Old Testament. A passage that speaks of discouragement and, and, and complaining. I'm quite confident that we all get discouraged. I'm also quite confident that we all complain from time to time, more than perhaps we would like to admit. Some of us complain about our circumstances. Some, no doubt, complain about work. Sometimes we complain about our bosses. Sometimes we complain about our spouse, about our kids, perhaps even our church. Some of us both knowingly and unknowingly, we complain too, or about God, and there's a difference. There's a difference. In Philippians 2, 14 to 15, we read this. You don't have to turn there. But we read that we are to do all things without grumbling or arguing, so that we may be blameless and innocent, innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And then it goes on to say, whom we are to appear as lights in the world. Interesting, there's a connection between grumbling and appearing as a light. Mm. Pastor Hughes has made this comment. It is one thing he says to complain to God, but it is quite another thing to complain about God. Is all complaining wrong? Well, the quick answer is no. The Psalms, the Psalms are full of complaint. And they're often described as the laments to God. The writers in the Psalms are pouring out their sorrow, their anger, their fear, their confusion, their disappointment, their depression, because of all the evil they see inside themselves because of all the evil they see outside of themselves. One third of the Psalms, believe it or not, is used to describe as complaints to God. They describe complaints to God, one third of the Psalms. <clears throat> Our Bibles tell us that there is a good way and a bad way to complain. Bad complaining is sinful. And bad complaining can be deadly. It can be deadly. Today we're going to look at one specific example, an incident where there's discouragement, there's complaining, and it's deadly. It's deadly. Turn in your Bible to Numbers 21. Numbers 21, please. We're going to read in verses 4 to 9 of Numbers 21. So reading from Numbers 21, verse 4. Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden. And the people began, became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the serpent, he lived. In these verses we, we read, people in Israel 
they become impatient. In some translations, the word that is used here is discouraged. They're discouraged. Impatient, we're told, because of the way. They're discouraged with this unexpected long journey. And in their discouragement, they begin to speak up. They begin to complain. And they complain against God and against Moses. And so what I want to do is I want to walk us through the narrative complaining today. And looking at complaining, I've got four C's to help us with the narrative. The first C will be the context of the complaining. The second C will be the cause of the complaining. Thirdly, we have the consequence of the complaining. And then finally, we're going to look at the cure. The cure of the complaining. So what's the context here? What's the context of these verses? And sadly, this is not the first time, is it? You know, when I think of our Bibles, this isn't the first time they've complained. We read of this complaining in all other passages of the Scripture. And someone writes this, they say, this is the main theme, the main global message. It's the main big picture of Numbers. Complaining. Numbers is all about complaining. Sadly, this grumbling, this complaining, this murmuring, it plagued the children of Israel. It plagued them while they journeyed in the desert. It was the sin that they could not shake off. It was the sin that weighted them down. And I would suggest it was their besetting sin. That was the besetting sin. And on many occasions, because of their murmuring, God's anger rises up. And it breaks out. It breaks out with a fearful display of severe judgment against them. And I want us to think about or look at a little bit of brief history of their grumbling. I'm calling it grumbling history. They're actually, if one takes the time to count, 15 times they grumble. Fifteen occasions of grumbling, of complaining, and they're scattered throughout the books of Exodus and Numbers, if we search them out. And interesting, I was thinking, the grumbling is like two bookends. You've got grumbling before they enter the desert, and you've got grumbling as they exit the desert. It's like two bookends. And they grumble, they grumble as they leave Egypt, and into the wilderness, and they grumble as they begin to leave the wilderness. And before they entered the promised land, they grumbled. They grumbled about the dying, possibly dying at the hands of the Egyptians. They, they grumbled about leaving Egypt, believe it or not. They grumbled about more wa no water. They grumbled about, not, or about being hungry. They grumbled about a lack of food. They grumbled about the type of food, believe it or not. They grumble about the taste of the food. They grumble about the wilderness. They grumble about the journey. They grumble that life is too hard. They grumble about dying of thirst. They grumble about dying of starvation. They grumble about their leaders. They grumble about Aaron. They grumble about Moses. They grumble about their enemies. They grumble about going to war, and they grumble about God. Lots of grumbling. And it all seems to hit a high mark in Numbers 14. We haven't read that yet, but that's previous to here. In Numbers 14, there's a crescendo. The train goes off the tracks in Numbers 14 with their grumbling. And things go from this sense of a great exuberance. They're excited to enter the promised land, this grumbling and complaining. They want to go back to Egypt. And to make matters worse, they make all these accusatory questions or statements about God and about Moses. Moses, why did you do this to us? This is in Numbers 14. Why did you bring us here to die in the wilderness? Why we were better left, left in Egypt as slaves? And this 
all happens right after the 12 spies, remember. They've returned from, from spying on the land of Canaan, and they come back in Numbers 13 and 14, and, and they tell the people of Israel what they've seen, and they become frightened. They become frightened of what the spies tell them. And there's a sinful response. And now, now, come to Numbers 21. Sorry, sorry. There's a sinful response after the spies. Sorry, back in Numbers 13, 14. And God puts his foot down. That's what he does. All that grumbling, all that complaining, all that murmuring in Numbers 13 and 14. And God puts his foot down. And what does God do? He says, enough. He said, I had enough. I've had enough of your rebellion. I've heard enough of your complaining. And he judges them. And he judges them harshly. And he delays their entry into Canaan. He delays it for 40 long years. That's God's judgment, Numbers 13 and 14. That was no small tap on the wrist, was it? No, that was a severe, severe judgment. And they feel it. They feel it. And they will endure it. And they will endure that judgment for 40 long years years. They will walk aimlessly, almost in circles in that desert for 40 long years. And that's where they die, most of them. And their dead bodies, they're left, they're left to die, they're left in the wilderness. And now, comes number 21, time has passed. 38 years, by the way, have passed now. And we come to Numbers 21. It's taken 38 years of wandering to get back here. And it's God's time now. This is the second time. This is another try. This is another opportunity to enter the, to enter the, conquer, to enter the promised land. So 38 years have passed. And now they're coming back almost the same spot in the desert for a second chance. And what else has happened here? What other events of time and history have happened? Well, by this time, hundreds of thousands have already died, believe it or not. So 38 years later, hundreds of thousands of the old generation have passed away. Many from old age. Only a few are left. Only a few of the old generation are left. Miriam and Aaron had died, and a few of those who rebelled some 38 years ago, they still remain. But in Numbers 21, in Numbers 21, this is a whole new generation. This is now their time. This is their time to shine. A new generation. So as we read the closing chapters of the book of Numbers, a new generation is getting ready here. The 40 years are coming to an end. And in verse 4, in verse 4, we're told that they are on the move. They head out from what's called the Mount Hor, H-O-R, by the way of the Red Sea. And they're heading towards Edom. And their plan is to, to head towards Edom and then to the banks of the Jordan, and then they want to head into the Promised Land. That's the plan. That's the plan they intend to follow. That's the, that's the road mark or the, the pathway. And there's reason to believe that everything's on the upswing. It can only get better, right? They're coming out of that desert place. There's excitement, there's, there's optimism in the air, they're, they're actually on the march again. They're going to the promised land. Finally, we have our second chance here. There's a new start, a new beginning as they head toward the promised land. Well, that's the context. That's the context. Our next heading, the cause, the cause of the complaining. Second heading, cause of complaining. Read verses 4 and 5. 
Look at verses 4 and 5. They set out from the Mount of War by the way of the Red Sea to go around, to go around, we're told, the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. They speak, speak out here against Moses and God. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food and no water. We blow this miserable food. Become impatient, haven't they? What, what, what's causing this? That's the, that's the question. All of a sudden, they, they become impatient. Turn back, turn back with me to chapter twenty. I want to read something here because I think this is very helpful. Chapter twenty. Look at verses fourteen. Verses fourteen, chapter twenty. From Kadesh, we're told. From verse fourteen. From Kadesh, Moses then sent messengers to the king of Edom. Thus your brother Israel has said, You know all the hardship that has befallen us, that our fathers went down to Egypt and stayed in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians treated us and our fathers badly. And when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out, of the, out from Egypt. Now behold, we are in Kadesh, a town on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or through vineyard. We will not even drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway, not turning to the right or to the left, until we pass through your territory. Edom, however, said to him, You shall not pass through us, or I will come out with a sword against you. That's the response of Edom. Again, the sons of Israel said to him, We will go by the highway. And if I and my livestock do drink any of your water, then I will pay its price. We're begging here. Let me only pass through on my feet, nothing else. We're just going to walk through your land and your brothers, by the way. But he said, you shall not pass through. This is the king of Edom speaking here. And Edom came out against him with a heavy force and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to allow Israel to pass through its territory. So Israel turned away from him. They hit a roadblock. That's what happened. They've run into an obstacle here. This king of Edom, he's refused to let them enter his land. And that was going to be the easiest and the surest way to the promised land. That was the shortest way to the promised land, to the land of Eden. Edom. If the crow flies, it's through the land of Edom. But the idea doesn't fly with the king of Edom. No, no. And they face this unexpected, this difficult detour. Their journey now will be much longer. It will be much more difficult. A lot more miles through desert, guys. And now they have to travel south. They have to go around the land of Edom and up the other side. Sorry, boys. Shortcut. No shortcut. No shortcut on the way to the promised land. And they're disappointed, they're frustrated, and they become, un they become impatient because of this roadblock. That's what happens here. Things aren't happening according to their plans. And to make matters worse, and here's an interesting point here, to make matters worse, the inhabitants, and it talks about them being blood brothers, they're actually connected with each other. They're descendants of Esau. <laughs> That's who they are. Jacob, I love Esau, I hate him. They're descendants of Esau. And they want nothing to do with Jacob and his boys. And the king's answer is no. It's a hard refusal. It's, it's hard to swallow. And then they rub salt in the wounds even more. Edom comes out and flexes their muscles. They become quite hostile. They come up with this large army and they, they're going to frighten and they're going to intimidate the children of Israel. No ifs, no buts, 
No confusion here, boys. You're not coming through our land. Well, that is the first reason. That's number one. That's number one why they're so frustrated. That's number one why they're so discouraged. Because it stirs up this discouragement. But there's another reason. There's another reason I'm going to suggest why they become so discouraged, why they start complaining. Look at verse 5 with me of 21. Chapter 21, verse 5. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness for there is no food and no water? And we loathe this miserable food. What's the problem here? What's the problem? Look at what's spewing, and I'm saying spewing. What's, look what's spewing out of their mouths. Look what they're saying here in verse 5. They were rather low, I would suggest, a very demeaning view of God and of Moses, don't they? God, in a sense, what they're saying is, God, you're not looking after us. God, you're not looking out for our good. God, you're not providing right for us. And they make a number of harsh, they're harsh, they're harsh accusations, some are outright lies against God. No food, no water, and it's loaf. Well, what do these comments tell us about them? What does it tell us about their hearts? Well, one thing they tell us, they forgot us. They have forgotten who God is. They have forgotten what God has already done for them. They have forgotten God's promises. Let me walk you through a few of them. Let me walk you through a few of what they forgot. They have forgotten that throughout their entire journey, Almost 40 years in the wilderness that God has never left their side. They have forgotten his protection and his daily provision for the entire time. They have forgotten that he has led them every step of the way since they left Egypt. The Lord went with them by day in a pillar of cloud, we're told. And by night, in a pillar of fire by night, he's leading them day by day. They have forgotten that God had provided their daily food and water for 38 plus years. They had forgotten that God's presence was always with them. They had visual proof of it. The tabernacle, the cloud, the pillar of fire. And they'd forgotten about God's law that he had provided to protect them, to keep them safe morally and physically. And they'd forgotten that God had protected them from their enemies. He protected them from, from the wild beasts of the wilderness and from the serpents, by the way, until now. And they'd forgotten that God had provided for them clothing every day. Remember, it doesn't wear out. Every step. And they'd forgotten that God had provided physically and spiritually for their needs in the desert for them to survive. And they'd forgotten God's promises. He promised them, He promised them that they wouldn't have the land flowing with milk and honey. They'd forgotten that. One person writes this I am stunned, he said. I'm stunned every time I read the story of Exodus. How can the people of Israel complain like they do? How could they be so ignorant, so stupid, so forgetful? And then he goes on here. The God of the universe, he says, tossed about the most powerful man on the face of the earth like a toddler with a rag. Doll. He takes Pharaoh and he tosses him around like a rag doll. 
And God didn't just humble Pharaoh, he broke him. And he displayed all of Pharaoh's feebleness and all of Pharaoh's helplessness and weakness. He displayed it all. A slave people, he says, and their God left Pharaoh and his powerful nation in shambles. And this omnipotence, this display of God's power, it sent vibrations throughout the entire world. Anyone who heard about it was full of fear and awe. And yet what was Israel's response? What was their response to this spectacular deliverance from Egypt? It was not one of praise. It was not one of worship. There was no trust here. Instead, sadly, Israel responds to this deliverance with grumbling, with complaining, with murmuring, and with quarreling. No water, Moses. Where's the meat, Moses? I have blisters on my feet, Moses. Who died and made you boss, Moses? And finally, are we there yet, Moses? Spiritual amnesia, spiritual forgetfulness had covered their eyes. It blinded them. It blinded them. And they, they, they'd forgotten God's gracious, His miraculous deliverance. They had spiritual amnesia. Spiritual forgetfulness. That's the disease they had. And it's a deadly disease. It's a deadly disease. And was, uh, was not this the cause? Was not this the cause of the 40 years of non-stop, non-stop complaining, grumbling, whining, and thanklessness? They forgot. They'd forgotten to remember. They'd forgotten to remember. Let's be clear, their complaining wasn't rooted in their circumstances. It really wasn't the bread or the water. That was only on the surface. That gave them an opportunity or an excuse to complain. It went much deeper. You had to dig down. It was rooted in their hearts. That's where the problem was. That was their problem. They had spiritual amnesia. They had spiritual forgetfulness. That was the deadly disease that penetrated. It penetrated to the very core of their being. And their hearts, their hearts were rotting within them. They forgot. They complained. Yes, complaining is forgetting. Complaining is all about forgetting. But what happens next? Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. The consequences. The consequences. What are the consequences to all this complaining? The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Many, if not most, Bit by these fiery, poisonous, venomous snakes, deadly snakes, sent by God purposely to bite, and the bites are lethal here. The people are poisoned, and the people are dying. I want to pause here and ask a question. Why are these consequences so severe? Why? Why so severe? Doesn't this judgment, doesn't it seem over the top? Sending venomous snakes to kill? Really? Does that really match the crime? Does, does that fit the crime? Is that really fair? Is, is that justice? Well, we know this from our Bibles. God is holy. We know God is perfect. 
We know his justice is perfect. God is perfectly just. The real problem, very possibly, if, if we begin to question God's fairness and God's judgment, the real problem is that we don't really see the great sin here. The real problem is we don't see the great sin. The severity of his judgment speaks to the severity of the sin. See the connection? And believe me, believe me, it's full. It sent a message. It sent a message to the people of Israel. This, by the way, this, by the way, was the last time they complained collectively. It sent a message. Complaining about God, complaining about God's leaders is sinful stuff. John MacArthur writes this. Few sins are uglier than the sin of complaining. Few sins are uglier than the sin of complaining. Jeremy, Jeremy Burroughs, or Burroughs, is a Puritan. Here's how he describes it. Complaining is the misery of all miseries. It simply makes you more miserable. Complaining is the misery of all miseries. It simply, it simply makes you more miserable. And let me remind you again of why their complaining was so simple. Why was it judged so severely? And let me just run through why. Why? Why was that sin so judged so severely? Their complaining was questioning who God really was. Can we really trust him? Their complaining was questioning the very character of God. Does God lie? Is God sufficient? Is God enough? Their complaining was questioning God's plan. There was a complete lack of trust in God. Somehow they believed that they knew something better than God. They had a better plan than God. They had a better way than God. Their, their complaining was questioning the leadership that God had ordained in Moses. A distrust in God's sovereignty, a distrust in God's wisdom. Their complaining was questioning God's provision. Can God really meet all our needs? Is God really sovereign? Is God really in control? Oh yeah, God has provided, but it's lacking. Oh yeah, God has provided, but the quality, have you seen it? It simply isn't good enough. Grumbling, complaining, murmuring, complaints. They were declaring out loud that God is not good, that God is not faithful, that God is not all loving, that God is not all wise, and that God is not all hard. Pretty serious stuff. Otherwise, if God was all these things, God would treat us so much differently. God would treat us better than this. We know what's best. Not God. Not God. Poisonous, venomous snakes sent out by God to bite, to poison, and to kill. Imagine the scene with me. Imagine, imagine if you were there. Imagine being bitten. The people being bitten. Many, if not most, are bitten by these snakes. snakes. Most are bitten, by the way. The language suggests most are bitten, if not all. People are dying all around you. People are staggering out of their tents. People are falling to the ground. People are lying on the ground. People are writhing in pain, rolling in pain, holding themselves 
people dying. Imagine the symptoms you'd see. And these are some of the symptoms that come from being poisoned by a snake, by the way. There's this twitching and, and, and tightening in the face, in the, in the facial mus muscles. There's severe abdominal cramps. There's blindness. There's the inability to speak. There's paralysis in the arms and in the legs. There's an inability to breathe. There's suffocation. And imagine the misery all that day. Imagine the misery you'd see. Imagine the misery you'd hear. The chaos, the panic, the running about, the screaming, the sobbing, the crying, the yelling, someone carrying a child that's been bitten. Someone crying over a dead husband or a dead wife, a dead child. Why? Why? Why all this chaos? Why all this sorrow? Why all this suffering? Well, it was all because of complaining. It was a complaining of a new generation. Complaining is a grievous sin, and punishment is severe because the sin is grievous in God's eyes. What a picture. What a picture of sorrow and suffering, all caused by sin, all caused by complaining. Well, the cure, what's the cure? What's the cure of complaining here? Look at verses 7, 8, and 9 with me. Two things happen in these verses. First, the people come out, they seek Moses out. And don't you find that a bit odd? They seek out the very one who they've been complaining about. Tables have turned rather dramatically here. And someone comments, makes a positive comment here. There's a small silver line in the clouds here, he says. It's unique to the new generation. They're a little bit different than the old generation, by the way. They at least acknowledge their sin quickly, the new generation. That's different than the old generation. And they go on to see their sin, they go on to name their sin, and there's no blame shifting here. They repent, they own their sin here. And then what does God do? He shows mercy. He instructs Moses to construct an image of a fiery snake, to set it on a pole where it can be seen. And if and when they gaze upon that bronze servant, they shall live. Interesting that God does not provide them exactly what they want or what they're seeking here. They want God to take the serpents away. That's what they ask for. That's what they plead. But that's not how God shows his mercy, is it? The serpents aren't removed. And it's also very possible those serpents continue to bite. They continue to strike no one here is going to be saved from being bitten. But if the one who is bitten chooses to obey God, if the one who is bitten looks at the bronze serpent on the pole, that one will be cured from the lethal bites, effects of the bite. Strange, strange cure, don't you think? No medicine to take, no serum to swallow, no, no doctor to see. There's nothing they can do for themselves here, nothing. They are helpless. There's absolutely nothing they can do. They simply must look. And that's the cure. That's the cure that stops the poison that's running through their veins. That's the cure that spares them, that saves them. Looking at the bronze serpent, their great sin of complaining is forgiven. Great mercy is displayed here. Death is prevented. And they have another opportunity, another opportunity to live and to enter the promised land. Well, that's the narrative. That's the narrative. So I want to wrap that up. I want to wrap it up. And the question I'm going to ask is, is how are you and I to combat complaining, murmuring, and grumbling in our own lives? How do you and I combat that, that sin of complaining? Well, I think from this passage, I think there are two lessons here we can take away, two lessons that we can walk away with. The first lesson we must recognize and take away is that complaining is sin. Complaining about our circumstances, questioning God's sovereignty, 
questioning God's care and provision, questioning God's wisdom and God's goodness is sinful. Someone says this, complaining has been described as a slow, subtle poison that builds up in our systems and usually goes undetected. It may be, he says, one of the least discussed sins in the church today. It's so common. It's so common in our lives, so pervasive, so frequent, so prevalent, that somehow we make it an acceptable sin. Everyone does it. Can't be that bad. But he says that doesn't diminish the ugliness of it or the seriousness of it. And he says here, he goes on, he says, that very hard, the very hard to complain is placing blame on God. Suggests that he has not provided what I'm sure I need. That's a serious charge against God. It's a serious sin. If you and I acknowledge the sheer evil, the sheer evil of the sin of complaint, that alone, that alone will help. That will help you be more hesitant, that will help you be more reluctant, and possibly stop your own complaining. It's a sin. It's a serious sin. And once you recognize that, that should help you. The second lesson, the second lesson we've learned here from the people of Israel, and we can take away, is the great need to remember. We must not be a forgetful people. We must remember, we must remember ourselves in both, we must remember in both the good times and the bad times of God's care and kindness in the past. The human memory, someone says, has a tend to be, tendency to be faulty and slippery when it comes to remembering past mercies. But he says there's a high cost to such forgetfulness. It deprives you, he says. It takes away the comfort you need, and it takes away the glory that God deserves. Let us remember then who God is. We need to be reminded from our Bibles who God is. Let us remember what God has done for us and the people in history and what he's done for each one of us in the church. And let us remember Christ. Let us remember Christ, our example. Christ is the highest possible conceivable example that you can have. He is the one, like the serpent on the bronze pole, pole, he is the one we must gaze upon. He is the one we must look upon. I want you to quickly, now I'm going to be quickly, turn to 1 Peter 1, 2, 1 Peter 2. I think it just helps you if you read, read it yourselves rather than me read it. Turn to 1 Peter 2. And I just want to read three verses, three verses in 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, verses 21 to 23. Let's read them together. Well, I'll read them, but just follow along with me. 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered, uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Christ, more than anyone else, this side of heaven, had opportunity. Christ, more than anyone else, had reason, had opportunity and reason to murmur and to complain. Christ did. But look at him. He was silent. He was a silent lamb that went to slaughter. He was silent. He did not complain. He did not protest. He did not utter one cry. This isn't fair. This isn't fair. Not one complaint. Not one murmur, not one grumble, not one syllable tainted his lips with sin, not once. And the 
question is why. Why? So that he could hang on that cross for you and me. And he could say with a loud voice, it is finished. He died to save sinners like you and me. He died to save complaining, murmuring, grumbling sinners like you and me. He is the finest, he is the greatest example we will ever find. And he is the one we must continually fix our eyes upon to remember, to help us to remember, and to fall, and to fall when we're tempted to complain. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time today to consider your word, to open your word, and to look at you and to look at Christ, to look at your great patience, your great mercy toward a complaining and unthankful God, a forgetting people. And Father, we ask that you help us, help us, help us to fight with every fiber of our being, our remaining sins. Help us to stop complaining. Help us to stop murmuring. It may be our desire, Father. It may be our desire to be the, the blameless children of God in your sight. In the midst of what's called a crooked and, and twisted generation, may we shine, Father. May we shine brightly because we don't complain. We ask this in Christ's name.